welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the BFI London Film Festival's industry programme uh, and to the first of our industry sessions this year. Um, I hope you're all getting to grips with the new platform and have all found your way here okay. Um, I'm going to sort of do a slightly ambling introduction just while you all find your way into our, um, into our virtual, virtual cinema space. Um, my name is Rowan Woods and I'm the festival's industry programmer. Of course, usually uh, this event would be taking place in one of our lovely cinema partner venues, but thank you for joining us in this unusual format in this really deeply unusual year. Um, before we start, I just want to say thank you to Film London and the Mayor of London, who are the sponsors of the press and industry programme this year. We've got some really great speakers lined up over the next 10 days, including Ava DuVernay and her team at Array, Jane Tranter from Bad Wolf, producer Ted Hope, new Sundance head Tabitha Jackson, producers Ed Guiney, Alan Reich and Liz Carlson, who'll be talking to us about making the move into TV and many, many more. But in this first session, we're going to hear from some of the next generation of independent producers who will reflect on the last six months and discuss some of the challenges and opportunities that they're facing at this time of great change and disruption. This session is going to be recorded and will be available for catch up probably about 24 hours after this session goes out and then it'll be available on the BFI's YouTube uh, site after the festival. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Tom Grater, international film reporter at Deadline, who's going to be moderating this session. Thanks so much. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm Tom Grater, international film reporter at Deadline, and I'm joined by six film producers for this roundtable discussion about the current status of the independent business. So we're going to get right into it, but I just want to quickly reflect on how crazy the last 10 months have been. Um, January 2020, the box office was booming with Star Wars 1917 and Little Women all rocking it. Cats was even in the top 20. Um, Parasite was on its way to grossing $250 million and Oscar glory. And COVID was still a pretty distant concern. Uh, February, the Berlinale happened and thousands of us got together without masks for a major film event. In hindsight, maybe not the best move. And then March happened with a massive spike in global cases leading to lockdowns, the closure of cinemas, the cancellation of festivals and markets and the shutdown of basically all productions. So flash forward six months and everyone, everyone is trying to return to some semblance of normality but clearly it's very tricky and there's a long road ahead of us. Production has restarted, but faces significant challenges and the cinema itself is, is embattled by a constantly shifting film slate. So amidst, amidst all of the headlines about Bond and Jurassic World, where does this whole situation leave independent film production? It's not an easy job at the best of times, but in this new world of COVID restrictions, insurance concerns, general economic downturn and an ongoing diversity and inclusion crisis and a lack of support for the arts. What are our speakers today doing to weather the storm and press on with making great movies? Or are they all just going to give up and retrain as bankers? So let's do a quick round of intros to get us underway. Um, it would be great if each of you could quickly introduce yourselves and maybe tell us a bit about your personal lockdown experiences. Um, Helen, why don't you get us started? Yeah, hello. Um, so I'm a producer. I produced uh, prayers and I was one of the co of the producers roundtable uh, which announced our um, guidelines just before lockdown happened um my look i had a baby at the start of part of it and um been trying to get some um yeah get get projects off the ground and figure out when they might be able to shoot sorry got to unmute myself classic rookie error um over to you joy um, hi, my name's Joy. I was a, I'm a producer. I did Blue Story. Um, lockdown. What have I done? Uh, a lot of Zoom exercises and um, just developing stuff, and also moving house in the middle of all of it as well. Um, it's been that's kind of been it really. The Zoom exercises a lot. Good, staying healthy. Uh, Matt, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, my name's Matt Wilkinson, indie producer, uh, seem to make a lot of films with day in the title for some reason. Um, recent survivor of a COVID production, so that's hopefully good news for people out there thinking about uh, how you get out of development. Uh, but also I've spent most of my lockdown in development, um, reading a lot of scripts and taking a lot of Zoom calls. Cool, I definitely want to talk about that soon, of course. Um, Elham, how about yourself? Um, great pronunciation, by the way. And my name's Elham Shakarifar. I'm a documentary producer. Uh, I've made films like A Syrian Love Story, Even When I Fall, Island of Love and Law, Ayuni, uh, which was actually due to premiere at CPH and then 
uh, that obviously became a virtual festival and so we released it online so the beginning of my pandemic experience was working out what to do with that film and since then I've actually used this time as as a period of reflection and thinking about learning and unlearning and and how I want to move forwards um, when we kind of I'm not entirely sure we're going to quite come out of this uh, but we don't need to talk about that <laughs> yeah <laughs> well we definitely will talk about festivals and markets of course um Fola how about yourself um yeah sure um my name is Fola Cronin O'Reilly and my work includes a film called Lady Macbeth with Florence Pugh my generation with Michael Caine and most recently Ammonite with Kate Winslet and Saoirse Ronan which is um, screening at London next week and yeah my lockdown has been um, like everybody else a very bizarre experience I was um, delivering Ammonite during that period um, so a very complicated process and also I was trying to set up um, my next film to shoot and realised just it was impossible this year so we've moved it to next year so I'm in prep on a film at the moment Cool. And finally, Amina. Um, I'm Amina Ayi Balin. Um, I've recently produced Rocks, which is in cinemas now. Please go and see it if you haven't. <laughs> uh, and um, I've co-produced um, Clio Barnard's latest film, Ali and Ava, which is in post. And that's what I've been really spending my lockdown doing. Um, my lockdown's been an experience of sort of double limbo, uh, where um, Rock was originally meant to come out in April. Um, it's been released five months later. And equally with Ali and Ava, um, we just sort of slid in there and did the um, pickups beginning of March. Um, but post has really been delayed um, by five months so uh, quite sort of an equal thing there which makes me think back to um, LFF last year when um, Rocks had its UK premiere and I was closing finance on Ali and Ava the same day so there's this constant it seems duality. like <laughs> it seems like so long ago doesn't it uh, I know. Um, yeah yeah well and I would reiterate go and see Rocks in cinemas for sure oh, thank um, you. So let's let's get the ball rolling by talking about production first, I think. So Matt, I'm going to come to you because I know you just recently wrapped your most recent film. So tell us a bit yeah. about getting back to that and, and how it went. Uh, so it was quite a complicated process. I mean, we were fully financed and closed. We'd actually made it to the first day of production in March on a film called The Score, which is something that we're terming a heist musical, although I don't really know what a heist musical is, but... It's a crime drama romance with the songs of Johnny Flynn. And we got to day one and the equipment was there and the sets were dressed and the crew turned up. But um, unfortunately we didn't really turn on much on, on day one. And then partway through day one, we elected to stand down because it was just clear that, um, you know, based on government guidelines, we, we weren't supposed to be going to work anymore. We weren't supposed to be gathering in numbers and we took all of that very seriously and we stood the production down. I think at that point we were confident that we were still insured because we were insured pre-COVID. So there was no COVID exclusions around the production, but it was more a question of what happens now? You know, what's our debt to the investors? Are they allowed their money back? Is this thing going to be disassembled? We've already spent X amount of money. Yes, there's insurance, but is any of that not covered? And actually more importantly for the talent and certainly for the writer director, how does one go about remounting something like this and and what's the what's the time lapse in between and i think we just set about constant set about trying to work that out as quickly as possible and it really did take us between april and august really to to figure that out to figure that out the insurance position what the payout was to give the financiers comfort that this was something that we could do and do responsibly. And the gulf between those two things was actually having lots of COVID conversations. So um, listening to what the PAC group had to say about it, seeing what was happening in commercials, um, and then just kind of taking that, res that producer responsibility of how do I create a safe workplace uh, 
at this time. What does that look like? And how, how do I get people to commit to that without unduly putting people at risk? And luckily, during that process, uh, the BFI launched their COVID continuation fund. We qualified for that. That was great. But I also found out at the time that several other producers I, I had a relationship with had qualified for that as well. So we started exchanging information around, well, how are you approaching it? And what does this look like? And it sort of became clear that there was a ceiling on what you could really do and what you could really afford to do. But that as long as you attempted to do all of those things, you were kind of doing everything possible. And so we put together what we called our COVID manifesto, which was just our productions set of guidelines that we wanted to work within. And that's the thing that we delivered back to the crew with their contracts. And it's the thing that went to cast with their re-upped cast agreements. And once everyone came on board our COVID manifesto, it was more about implementing that and to a certain degree enforcing that. And we had a brilliant team of onset COVID safety supervisors who oversaw that day to day. And I realize it's kind of an odd thing, COVID safety supervisor, because it didn't exist until now. So you're not really drawing on a wealth of someone's experience. You're not hiring the best COVID safety supervisor in the land because you're hiring someone who's kind of, to a certain degree, figuring it out or has figured it out, but has figured it out quite recently. But they were very vigilant and dedicated and they didn't want our production to undergo any risks and every situation was assessed. But but actually on one of the early packed calls I was on, somebody said a very smart thing, which is producers deal in risk. That's what you do. You're in the risk business. So just because COVID is a new risk and you know not to be taken lightly, it's just another day-to-day -day thing where you are taking health and safety seriously, but where you're dealing with a lot of people and a lot of moving parts. So I think as soon as we took on board that it was different, but also well within our wheelhouse as producers, um, we kind of got a little bit more comfortable with that. But I'm saying this from a position of already having insurance and having that insurance carry into that production. So I think it's less about how do you manage it and more about what your liabilities are if things do go wrong and if that does have a financial impact on your shoot. All right. So you had um, an insurance policy that re remained in place throughout the production, even though you had to remount it kind of several months later. Yeah, which paid out um, the remount costs, but also, as you say, continued to to cover COVID related risks on on set. Right. Um, I mean, that's that sounds that sounds brilliant. I'm just curious to know if anyone else who's kind of in uh, in prep or, or, or nearing shoot. I mean, how are you guys finding the insurance question? Um, we just applied for the government restart scheme because um, I think that just launched on Friday. Um, but I think it should be fine for us insurance wise in terms of us shooting. I think, you know, like Matt was saying, it's already about ensuring the cast and crew feel safe and set and having like a very clear plan as to how we're going to deal with that when we start shooting in a few weeks. But I think, yeah, it's just about having a very clear plan and also, you know, testing regularly. And because, um, you know, the cars aren't going to be fully in PP at really any time. So just about ensuring that they feel safe and they feel like they're being looked after and ensuring social distance and having bubbles for each for, for each um, group as to who goes where and who, who doesn't go where. And I imagine there's quite a lot of work being done um, in terms of kind of reworking uh, reworking just the structure of how you put a production together i mean have, have you have any of you guys had to have you had to rework scripts at all for to, for a kind of covid safe shoot i mean we've definitely had to rework <laughs> the script that we're doing or rethink certain set pieces because of covid so pieces that would have been, been bigger suddenly become more intimate but you know with social distancing in between um so pieces where you would have like 20 extras, you suddenly have 10 extras and using people from the same household or students and stuff like that, refiguring out how to create those big set pieces work. This has definitely come into play when thinking about the script. Yeah, we, we didn't have to change the script because luckily enough, it was quite a contained story anyway and really we were operating in two main locations although we did have to change one of our locations between the original shoot 
and the remount just for that sort of social distancing angle. But in terms of extras, like Joy's saying there, we ended up having less extras on set. And in one instance, we ended up bringing down the age of an extra because there was a kind of 75 plus that was one of the original characters. And that was just something that we didn't feel 100% confident about going in. And for those of you who are kind of in, in development now, is this a huge part of your thinking? Are you thinking we need to create projects that will be more COVID safe? Fola, I'm, I'm looking at you. Um, no, um, and, and not okay. in terms of my development, because I, I mean, for me, development takes such a, a long, long time. Um, but focusing in on the, the, the film I'm prepping right now, um, I've had to um, change the DNA of how we're setting it up because originally we were looking at, um, or we were hoping to do the majority of prep in the first two weeks of shoot in and around Dublin and then move to a rural part of Ireland to shoot our our um, our location scenes. Um, but um, we're now restructuring it where we're creating a bubble production on location for the entirety of prep and shoot. Um, so I'm working through that at the moment. Um, so yeah, I, I, our, budget, our budget is trying to absorb all of those additional costs. Um, we were hoping to save on um, accommodation and, and travel by being in and around Dublin because the majority of crew are, are based around there. Um, so yeah, our budget's taking a bit of, of a hit in that way, um, but it's necessary. The bubble scenario is vital for us to shoot. Um, but we haven't yet delved into our script from a COVID point of view. So there's no doubt that certain scenes will have to be adapted um, to make sure we're shooting in the most safe way. Um, but again, the guidelines of testing, social distancing, the bubble production, I would hope will limit the, um, the amount of times we're gonna have to compromise uh, creatively. Um, but again, we haven't yet started that process. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll delve into it very soon. I don't think it really should change your um I hope that, not yeah I don't think it should change your yeah. development unless you're trying to be just opportunistic because actually we all know how long it takes things to get financed and then into production if all the development you were focused on was around small stories then it's not lending that much hopefulness for the future of production in say a year to 18 months time so I completely I completely agree yeah so I'm just um I'm focusing on our production coming up rather than f for future projects, um, for sure. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a production conversation, isn't it? It's not a development conversation. You develop yeah. the story you want to tell in the way you want to tell it, and then yeah. if you are lucky enough to package and finance, and we're still in COVID, you look at how you might have to modify the production elements. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I'm realizing on um, the shoot we're going to shoot ne or the film we're going to shoot next is that um, I mean we're, I love making films because we get to interact with communities we would usually never interact with where we're making and shooting a film um, you'd work with locals you'd befriend you know uh, your neighbours and it feels very much like you try and make yourself a part of the community uh, because we're creating this bubble we're essentially going to cut ourselves off and that is immensely disappointing where we can't integrate with the community um you know but that's just it's a sacrifice we have to make in order to make our film yeah the the worst part about producing a film during covid was almost the atomization you, you, you're right a film is a family and then a film that's behaving well is is creating a larger family through its through its journey through production but you know you, you're just not able to do that you have to be in your we're yeah. talking about bubbles here we had them as cohorts on our set you have to be in your cohorts and that means you travel with your cohorts you eat with your cohorts for, for me sort of monitoring what's going on I wasn't necessarily on on set during the production I was on location but I was in my cohort monitoring what was going on on set so you have a weird atomization that is actually quite anathema to, to 
production. Production is about a coming together. And this was more about understanding which elements mm -hmm. happened before, which elements. It was quite sort of, um, yeah, it was quite kind of piecemeal in that sense. It must have been quite lonely, was it? Um, yeah, to, to, to be honest, it, it, it was a little bit lonely, or at least it was you were having the same or similar interactions with with the with the same people and you were understanding and overseeing what was going on in other parts of the production but um certainly communication was stag staggered access was staggered and relationships i kind of thrive on the fact that i've created relationships not just with cast but with crew that i try and take from film to film and i'd brought some of my crew onto this production but i didn't really create any new relationships on this production because i just didn't get the proper chance to interact with those people and also as i said before most of those new people i really know as kind of that and and not much else. So there's a sort of strange distancing on that front as well. So yeah, lonely is one way of putting it, but kind of to a degree disconnected or if not disconnected, just communicating, learning to communicate in different ways. Can you tell us a bit about that communication? I'm, I'm curious to know how you, how you surmounted that. Uh, so a day in, um, I realized that I needed to say things to the director at a crucial point while he was on set and I wasn't on set and we'd elected that the producers wouldn't be on set because we'd created a bubble that was camera team and the actors and the director. And I realized I just didn't have a way to get in there. So I was trying to phone the director on his phone and hope that he would pick up. And in the end we elected to have kind of producer radio. So you're sat in the tent with your producer radio and you know, you're trying to communicate that way, but it's not, it's not how you would want to do it. You'd want to be sat next to your director and you'd want to, you'd want to have a very, I don't know how, I can't speak for the other producers here, but I'd want to have a very close and easy relationship with that, that director and I'd want to be with them. Even if I wasn't contributing anything in the moment, I'd want to be with them and we'd have a constant back and forth. Whereas this was watching, grabbing the radio, trying to insert a note or trying to, to discuss something in a moment where they were kind of somewhere else doing something else. And that's, that's not a usual experience for me. How is, um, how is everyone else feeling about getting back on set? Um, Elam, you, uh, you kind of specialize in documentary films. Uh, is, is that a different, is that a different kind of challenge? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's really interesting to think about um, what everyone else has been dealing with and it feels like, well, I mean, you know, the way that financing works for films versus documentaries is also different. I think the way that I work often has to be, you raise a bit of money, you make a little bit of the film, and that's also a way to retain some sort of independence or agency. Um, I tend to work with underrepresented voices, and I think it's really key to build little by little how you're going to make the film. So for me, these last couple of months have really been a lot about thinking about that notion of a film becomes a family, I think it's been a lot more, um, it's been a space of nurture a lot more than it has been about actively making anything. And, and to me, that is absolutely part of my role or our role as a film team. Um, how do we weather this storm together? Uh, so I, I mean, I'm producing like there are two films that I'm producing that were kind of in pre-production going to enter production just as we were all locked down and we basically cancelled but have so far postponed the shoots on on one of them um, and have just shifted the focus to other things because I feel that if we don't have to be filming right now we don't have to be filming and on the other, it's a collaboratively made film. It's quite a complex model. There's quite a lot to think through in terms of making it um, ethical and safe, kind of even outside of COVID. So it's given us just a lot more time to think that all through. Um, but I think the difficulty for documentary is that it's a lot less structured. There's no schedule really, you know, you can write your plan, but nothing ever goes to plan. So I think this space of feeling safe and taking risks with documentary, it sits slightly differently. Um, a lot of the films that I make also rely on travel internationally. None of that is possible. So I'm kind of taking a very different perspective. I think, 
I don't know how long that's going to be possible for, but I'm trying to ensure that we're basically doing things in the most um, safe way. And I mean safe in, in lots of senses. I'm, I'm really concerned about mental health um, for people around me. And I think that's going to be a concern going forwards, a much bigger concern to me than say, filming or being in production or meeting deadlines, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, well, we've certainly seen this, a, a greater spotlight put on mental health in general during this period. And so, you know, I think one of the things we'll try and get out of this panel is what what positive things might come out of this and maybe, you know, more attention on, on things like that might be might be one of those things. Um, Helen and Amina, I'm just kind of curious to get your takes on on your kind of upcoming work and how you're looking at that. And I'm interested to know, do you guys agree with the thing that Matt and Fola were saying a minute ago about... Um, you know, develop your projects as they are, because I think we're seeing a lot of things being announced right now that are clearly heavily influenced by COVID. There's a real lean into single location shoots, for example. I mean, we were lucky that the the only thing that we were looking to maybe shoot towards the end of the year, because I was going to take some time off anyway, um, was very contained. And that was just completely lucky. And it's like pretty much set in one house. Um, and so all we've we've done with that is actually try to scale it down even more um, and and have it be like Fela was saying just one bubble um, and it, it kind of is lucky that that's the script that we were getting nearest to production with and then everything else I mean they're all quite big things or you know we've got something that's set in a school we've got something that's a huge ensemble cast we've got um, you know films that I think will be quite difficult to do uh, or, or it's just going to take, like you say, all that planning once you actually get to prep. So I think we're just, apart from this first film, we're just really acting like the other ones might might take place in some sort of normality, or that by then we'll have such a sort of rigorous system that everybody's used to, that hopefully it won't be such a shock to try and get them made. And yes, I, I don't, um, after doing two films back to back that are quite, you know, very detailed, um, hands on producing, you know, both with kind of a strong uh, community involvement and community spirit that is part of the creative process and part of, you know, the film um, uh, with very special um, consultants, contributors, collaborators. Um, so I think really this is a, a great time for me myself as a producer to develop those projects that really sort of ignite and excite me. Um, you know, I, I always wanted to make a film like Rocks actually and I'm just, you know, I was a teenage girl three decades ago in the 90s and why has it taken so long to make a film like Rocks? Because, you know, I knew my friendship group appealed, you know, had an amazing energy and appealed to uh, lots of people found us funny or lively or, you know, and that's the same thing with Rocks is being embraced by all, all audiences, all demographics, um, you know, and that's, that's the thing that I really want to do. So I'm developing projects, not with, um, uh, not bearing COVID in mind, because I think that's limiting uh, creatively. Um, but don't get me wrong, because I'm still also phoning all my, um, uh, colleagues and HODs and crew and other producers um, because I've worked in the British film industry for 18 years I started out as a, a floor runner and uh, and it's very interesting just to be a kind of um, I wouldn't say tourist but you know just <laughs> seeing how they're coping and you know what, what what are the differences between how productions are, are approaching Covid you know what, what exactly how are they approaching their insurance situation because that has really changed um you know where where are you know things are a very good idea in the bubbles in effect but you still get strangers walking on set so it's like how do you police everything if you're making productions on a on a low budget because if you're making a studio picture you can get the anti-back gel on a truck in but you know on a low budget production you can't so it's just all those kind of variables so I'm just sort of building a knowledge because I I do agree with Ellen that um, you know we we don't know, and I think my my process of doing a film in post, and you know actually there is a limit on what you can do remotely, and and you know you need to be hearing the same sound, you need to be seeing the same picture, and having those creative and collaborative notes. Otherwise, um, you know 
your film is compromised and we would never ever compromise our films. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and uh, of course the, you know, with studio pictures, the risk is just so much, uh, I, I suppose on a, on a bigger production, the risk is, is increased, but they can swallow that risk. Whereas on an independent production, you know, even a 10,000 pound COVID safety fine is, you know, could be, could be really detrimental. So um, clearly the risks are, are greater, I think. And um, I'm curious to know with this new uh, restart program, I believe it's called this kind of um, UK insurance fund, which I think Joy, you said you were, you were in the process of applying. So I'm curious to know kind of what's the, what's the latest on that? I think we were waiting for EU approval. Yeah, I think um, well, applications are open. I forget the company that's doing it, but um, it's literally just an online application. It's pretty quick, straightforward sort of thing. But I will say on the COVID thing, um, the financiers that we're working with are, are very supportive in terms of like money wise to ensure that we can afford the resources. Um, Cause you see, you know, it, there is one studio involved but it's still BFI film for, and they are very kind of, will give you the money you need just for COVID, which for us is a fair chunk, but I think it's been good to kind of have that uh, support and, and them just going, no, take some more, take some more, just because there are things that they feel need to be in place because, you know, more wants to learn as we go along. But I think, yeah, on the insurance thing, we've only just applied. So I have to come back to you as to how it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we will wait to hear more on that eagerly, I think. Um, and I just want to quickly take a moment to remind people watching that you can submit questions for our panelists using the, the handy little Q&A tool. So do do that and we'll go through some of those at the end. Um, Amina, I just want to come back to you and ask about the process of releasing a film right now. I mean, it's, it's the world of cinema in terms of the physical buildings is completely upside down, but I feel like there's a, an enormous amount of positivity around the a Rocks release. How's it going? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, I mean, we have to say to ourselves, there's an element of it is what it is. And, um, you know, but I think what it's really highlighted is that the people that have gone to the cinema, um, you know, it's even a higher experience, you know, that connection that you feel in the cinema, um, you know, it, it's so heightened and the emotional responses. And, you know, that's been lovely to hear from, various people um, and rocks you know has had its release altered and um, but you know the Odeon is is showing it this Saturday in in lots of locations at 7 p.m and and that's really great for it so you know we you know we're doing our best um, a lot of younger people are going to the cinema you know that whole cinema going um, demographic is changing you know my aunt in Glasgow she has to go every week. She hasn't been the whole period. So, you know, as producers, we just want um, everyone to see our film, you know, as many people as possible. And, um, you know, that, that's, you know, we're just so pleased for those people that have been going and supporting Rocks. And, you know, and for like, you know, um, myself and other people, the creative team for Rocks, that we never saw ourselves on cinema screens. And I think that political... Um, you know, uh, when you see yourself on screen or you see your peers on screen or you have that connection or, you know, as a parent or a grandparent or wh whatever it is, you, you see youth represented like that. That's That's been exciting. And it's just, it's different. It's completely different. It changed throughout the lockdown period. Um, I couldn't quite even visualize release. And um, I remember going to the, the Ritzy on the last night it closed in March, which is my local cinema, and I saw all the cutout, cardboard cutouts for rocks, um, you know, with the April release date. So I took one home as a souvenir. Um, so, but uh, yes, so, um, you know, anyway, that's, that, that is that experience with rocks. We, I love the film. Cool. <clears throat> um, I we, just, we, I just oh, sorry, add something to that. I love the film as well, but I also just wanted to say in this conversation around um, the experience of the release, it's just that films also, like the film is now there and this is one engagement with it, but there will be other generations who will engage with it. There will be people who have grown up with it and it'll, it'll develop a life. And 
so often we talk about these things, you know, we're talking about cinema releases as if they're just like the one thing. So they've become the very defining thing in a film's life, but this might also be an opportunity to shift that a little bit because there are, there are lots of other factors as to why a film like Rocks hasn't been made before. And yeah. it, does, it does actually have to do with how films are released. It's got to do with who's writing about them. It's got to do with all of these things within this ecosystem. And so to me, okay, yes, the, obviously it's a different relationship because I was waiting for it since LFF last year. Um, but I think that it will live, it will live a life and it will just look very different. And I think that's a great thing as well. It's it's interesting as well that um, I'm I'm not talking about rocks here and I um, embarrassingly I haven't seen rocks but I'm very I'm very excited to catch up with it. Um, I had a film released during lockdown as well, a title called Days of the Bagnold Summer, and actually it was due to have a small theatrical release and I, I think a lot of that was kind of built around as what Elham is saying there, the expectation of films to start in cinema and and kind of move through the platforms. But actually, the best thing that could have happened to it was to be a TVOD release because it was only going to get a certain amount of press around it, a certain amount of marketing around it. And actually a film about a mother and son stuck in a house during the summer, playing to an audience stuck in a house during lockdown, we kind of chimed with the moment and it actually got, I think it probably got a much stronger response than it would have had had it come out through the classic platforms of, you know, not even filling rooms in in smaller um, cinemas in the UK and then kind of having a delay before it got to the point where people could actually just click to see it. And I actually feel like, uh, just looking for upsides in, in this at the moment, I actually feel like people have got over the barrier of the click to view, that we've all got subscriptions and we all understand how the cinema works, but a lot of people weren't necessarily doing the, the TVOD, they weren't necessarily that at, ho that at home with paying five pounds or 10 pounds or whatever to see a film as a one-off at home that just wasn't part of the parlance it wasn't what most people were doing but I feel like we've got over that hurdle now and the idea of of TVOD being a sort of more um active part of 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 the release of film feels quite quite encouraging to me because it's not that not every film deserves to go to the cinema it's more that not every film has the power to survive in the cinema or compete in the cinema but the fact that there's now a place where people can go where it slightly levels the playing field to a certain degree or just that people have more access i i think it's really about access if you read about a film in whatever format and you know you want to see it but you can't get to that cinema or it's only playing for two weeks or whatever but it's there on your t-bot there's a there's a greater chance of you interacting with it in its in its first iteration and i, I think that can only be a positive thing I mean, there's a lot of negativity right now around uh, cinemas after the the cine world move and and um, all of these huge films delaying into next year and beyond. But I'm curious to know: does anyone think that creates a bit of an opportunity for independent films? I mean, you know, a lot of cinemas are still open, and and we know that people still want to go to the cinema. So, is is there kind of with Bond delaying six months? Is there more of a window for some of these independent movies to to thrive? I don't know if, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I feel like everybody is just guessing at the minute and guessing about everything and figuring out as we go along at every level. But to a degree, that's kind of always been what we've done. And I've not been in the film industry that long, but like the the time that I've been in it, like it's always, there's always very negative conversations about how, how hard it is to be a producer and how hard it is to get films made and the state of independent cinema. But then you talk to people and it's like, that's that's been a conversation for decades and, um, maybe even centuries like the, the death of film is coming and even with the opportunities that are now in tv and the way that that's flourishing i think that's great but i think people will always have a desire to watch movies and i think we just have to figure out how best to do that and like technology that we have now um perhaps that's one way and then there'll also be the event cinema and there'll be those bigger movies and perhaps this is an opportunity to find those those middle ground films those mid-budget movies that don't get made so much um it's we don't really know but i hope that we can all use it as a kind of positive opportunity to shape it again once we come out of this or whatever that looks like 
I, th I think what it's definitely done is it's encouraged people to watch different kinds of films. Maybe people who would have just gone for the blockbuster, now that they're being denied that, they're looking for other stories. And if that means that the appetite for other stories increases, then that's definitely an ancillary benefit. And, you know, it, it's it's probably an obvious point that if there's less competition in the cinema, there may be more chance for people to see your film. But I still think it's an awareness conversation. Even if you're the, yours is the only film in the cinema, if people haven't heard of it, then they're, they're just not going to find it. Yeah, interesting point. And and um, on the subject of streaming, I mean, this has clearly been a boom time for streaming. I'm curious to know, are you guys actively exploring, you know, that those relationships? Are you trying to set projects up at streamers because there's just a clearer route to distribution right now? I, I think we probably all are trying to set projects up all over the place all the time with anyone who feels like a right fit, who's gonna help us set a project up. So, you know, by nature, producers are opportunistic and this is a new playing field. And so we're gonna go and play on it. But um, from my point of view, I've found them quite impenetrable. It doesn't feel like a straight route. It feels like there's lots of things between you and having that conversation. But yeah, they're platforms and they're very successful platforms and they're very rich platforms. and if it's the right film and the right relationship, I, I for one definitely want to be in that space, but not to the exclusion of only being in that space. Yeah, I totally agree. And I also kind of feel like um, everyone is sort of like looking at streamers now. So it sort of feels like we're normal at cinema, so let's just sort of go to on streamers, which yeah, it does mean you have an audience, but at the same time, do you get lost in everything else that's happening be it on Netflix or Prime and algorithm. So I think it's a balancing conversation as to how you want your work to be seen, basically. And also it's about like who, um, who they want to champion at what stage, because I think there's definitely a tendency with streamers to just pick or pluck the talent that's sort of um, made their mark in the independent world and then run with that. And, that's that's fine and that's great but it's also then how do you tell those new stories and bring those new directors and writers out um and i think maybe that's slightly easier in tv maybe they take more of a punt but in film i think um that's that's potentially a bit more difficult with streamers because they they want to know um that they're going to be able to get those eyes on it and like joy says if you don't have the publicity around it like it's much more likely that the film comes out gets good press from its own release and being made by itself and then they take it than necessarily a, a debut for instance going straight on, on the subject of tv i mean there's just an incredible amount of it right now being developed and and packaged i mean are you guys looking to move into tv is this kind of is it a bit of a bubble are we are we afraid that the tv bubble could burst at some point I don't think it could burst, but I think it's um, something to think about in terms of just being sustainable. Um, I think TV does make sense, but I think it's also that thing of there is also a lot of content out there. So I think it's just about finding the right kind of content that somebody's willing to 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 jump on with you, if that makes sense. And also it's much harder to just like produce TV in the way that uh, you might be able to somehow pull together a movie um so we're finding that we've and we've been we've been working on quite a few tv projects in lockdown developing them but we've set them up as co-productions so we've been the sort of junior producing partner with more established tv companies because us on our own going to a commissioner um we didn't feel was going to work at this point but if we can partner up with someone more established in comedy for the comedy thing and drama for the drama thing then it gives it a better shot because also i think the kind of rate of projects being developed to actually getting made in TV is much more of a thin funnel than in film. That's the impression I've got so far. <laughs> yeah, f film is still the independent space, isn't it? No one's stopping you making the film. You don't have to make a film with distribution. If you do a good job, you can go out and find your home for it. But you're not really independently making TV on a wing and a prayer. So you're having to deal with a small number of gatekeepers who are kind of giving you permission to do that. So it feels like a good way to potentially add revenue to your uh, company. But at the same time, you've probably got far more to push against in terms of getting that first one away. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, um, one of the 
the key platforms for these indie movies, of course, is the festivals and the markets that take place kind of all around the year. And this year we've seen an incredible amount of disruption to those. Um, Fola, what, what was it like having this, this um, kind of movie that you that was clearly going to secure a great festival slot? What was it like just kind of watching all of that unfold? And, and are you happy with how it's worked out? Um, yeah, I mean, it was strange not being able to go to Cannes or Telluride, um, um, but immensely um, exciting to physically premiere at TIFF, which is a wonderful festival. And um, I have a relationship with them because Lady Macbeth actually premiered there a few years back. Um, but for us, because of Sersha and because of Kate, our profile was always going to be protected. And um, so, so our film is, it, it's fine, it's going to be fine, but it's more the smaller films that um, I'm disappointed for, because I can't imagine if we were say, releasing or premiering Lady Macbeth this year, because we so needed Toronto and that premiere, because nobody before that premiere knew who we were, knew the film, um, and so we really needed that festival and that launch and that buzz around the film to get our distributors on board. So I'm disappointed for the smaller films, but in terms of Ammonite, Ammonite will be grand um, because of the people we have involved in the production. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it will be. Um, and you're kind of, uh, the film is now presumably uh, making a run into the awards season. That's been delayed, but it's still happening. Um, it's kind of crucial for the whole ecosystem. How, how, how are you feeling about that? Does it have the same kind of level of excitement that, that it would normally have? Um, yeah, I hope, uh, I mean, the award season is, our priority is to get the film out there. And so all our distributors are pushing to, to release the film theatrically. Um, and it's amazing. They, um, love the film and support the film so much so that they really want to do that um, and so yeah I mean in terms of awards that's that's definitely not on my mind um, but there is an excitement around there and um, a pride as well everybody is very happy with the film which is wonderful um, but yeah we're just looking to the theatrical release at the moment and hoping that goes well and I, I, for one, have really missed film festivals. I've missed like being in Cannes with all you guys. Um, missed that kind of face-to-face -face interaction. I think I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm over Zoom, shall we say? But um, I mean, have, have, have you guys found the virtual events helpful? Have you been participating in those? Have they helped your projects? I've really enjoyed the fact that I've been able to engage with festivals that I've never been able to go to. So. I attended loads of things at Black Star. I attended the IDA's Getting Real conference last week. And those are spaces that are very much in tune with the thinking that I think is really interesting in the documentary space or the space around who's making films on what terms, how, um, a conversation that I feel is still only just emerging here. And I thought that was amazing. And there is something about festivals I think that is intrinsically hierarchical. Markets are incredibly hierarchical. They rely on filmmakers to, you know, decision makers are put on a kind of pedestal. They're paid to be present. They're paid to have kind of opinions about essentially the stories being presented to them. I think that needs to be flipped. You know, the richness of the film industry is the filmmakers. It is the stories they're telling and we need to think about how we support people to actually make those stories better. And to me, I think there's something about this, this flattening of everything into a virtual space that should be seen as an opportunity. I think it's meant many people who, who can't as easily traditionally enter a space for whatever reason, whether it's economical or related to mobility or access um, has had opportunities not enough maybe even in the virtual space, but I think these are things that we should be actually taking forwards. And that in a sense is much more important to me than, I mean, I, I love going to Cannes, but I would much prefer to be able to 
to actually say support the filmmakers that I'm working with to have a really inclusive experience when they're in those spaces because I, I'm not sure they actually do. It's an interesting point and I mean on, on the subject of of inclusion and, and I suppose the diversity question, this has been a, a, even though COVID has dominated pretty much everything we've done for the last nine months, this has still been a, a time of like fierce political and social action. And in the uh, shining a light kind of on the film industry, we've, we've seen the, the BAFTA um, review recently after the outpouring uh, at the beginning of the year. I mean, do we feel like this is a time of, of positive progress? Is COVID getting in the way or is this a moment where maybe there is an opportunity to learn some, some valuable lessons on, on that front. Ellen, I'm gonna throw it back to you. <laughs> oh, well, there's certainly an opportunity for people who've been too busy to stop and think about it, to think about it now. Um, I think the one good thing about the, the BAFTA review is that basically the question of diversity has always been brought up in relation to who's excluded rather than, rather than who is doing the excluding. Um, it's a point that Gemma Desai brings up in her piece, This Work Isn't For Us, which I really recommend um, thinking about why this isn't a level playing field and what the issues around diversity and inclusion are in film and the broader arts in this country. Um, so, and, and I think that's one of the good things about that review is that actually it's an organization that's turning, thinking about where it stands. I, there, there are many other things I could also say about the review, but I am really keen to also see where other organizations um, are kind of questioning and holding themselves to account. I mean, it's really interesting to me that in so many spaces, everyone's looking to actually the most vulnerable people in the room for answers to know what they're doing. So as an independent producer, I'm doing all sorts of things to make my tiny productions inclusive and accommodating and safe and to care but actually the responsibility for care is one that I hold but why do none of the people um, who are financing my films hold the same responsibility why have they not checked in in the same way with the people that I work with um, you know that kind of care and concern it should be shared and that duty of care always falls on the producer particularly independent producers on their own and I haven't actually seen enough of anyone in a more, say, powerful or certainly comfortable space thinking about the same things that I've been thinking about these past months. Yeah. And Helen, you um, published this producers, you were a part of publishing this producers roundtable report earlier in the year, um, which highlighted a kind of variety of, of issues across kind of mental health, diversity, financial questions. I mean, just curious to know what the response to that has been. Have you seen any positive movement? It has been really positive and I, I feel like it was a really nice coming together. Of, I mean, I, we're a very friendly community anyway, I think as producers, and we do try and support each other in every way, but that was really nice to have that. And I think it did make a difference. And we had lots of producers come back to us and say they'd been offered more money when normally they wouldn't, um, that they had felt confident enough to hold on their fee percentage and I really I do hope that this doesn't mean we go backwards in that respect because we're so desperate to make the film and now we've got this extra 15 percent of covid costs or more or and you know the only place to take that is our fee and and I do worry I've been thinking about it a lot recently just we, we're doing a one day thing at the weekend and the number of people that were that were getting in touch about running and I I do think like how are people going to get into the film industry now when and all of the things I would normally say for you to do I don't know what that looks like now you know you can't necessarily just go and make a short you can't get a running job because there's not that many productions happening there's no in-house positions or internships um, if companies are struggling does that mean that the paid internship that maybe was started a couple of years ago now becomes unpaid like that's that is something that I think we collectively need to think about and, and talk about what that's going to look like because it's going to be even harder for the next generation to get involved. And especially if we've got a government suggesting that the arts are not a viable career and you know everything piling in and people wonder, wor worrying about their livelihoods, I just, I do worry about what that's going to do to access. Yeah, I, I think about that a lot when I get asked, you know, 
how did you become a producer? But then what advice would you give me in terms of how I become a producer now? And I don't know, like everything I did to get the opportunities that I got just don't seem to be there anymore. And, and as you're saying, it's even tougher now because there's less production. So how do you even get the access? So yeah, it's, um, and not to kind of bang the gong for producers, but obviously part of producers job is, is um, job creation, isn't it? You're, you're creating an environment that can employ people. They can get more experience. So it's not just about the stories. It's about, it's about the accessibility to jobs within our industry. And if the producers aren't there to provide the work, then what's everyone else doing? It's, it's a kind of knock-on effect. Definitely. And I think one thing that we're doing and um, on our production is that for each department trying to create trying to create that level of accessibility, whether it's a trainee role or whatever, just bringing in or um, putting on the HODs to find somebody, whether they're of color or um, a sexuality, whatever it is, bringing somebody in that normally wouldn't have that access but making sure they're part of their team, um, whether it's work experience, training, and also working a little bit with uh, signature pictures because they, they run a trainee scheme but just having a few of their trainees come on board, whether it's for a couple of days, two days, to kind of it create some sort of, you know, entry point in and they have something on their CV. But I think that's something that I've been trying to encourage all the departments to do as a way of helping. Yeah, it's clearly very important. Um, just want to make time for an audience question. So Deborah is asking about financing, um, which we've kind of touched on, but she, she says, uh, are financiers now more wary about the viability of production and distribution? And I mean, famously, financiers tend to be extremely risk averse. I'm just curious to know the conversations that you guys are having. Are you, are you, is it different now? Are you finding um, those conversations to be, to be trickier? Are people, st is the financing still there? I think people, uh, for us, is um, distribution-wise, everyone seems fairly confident because we're looking at a year away. But production is just more about how COVID safe are we? And it's just more about ensuring crew safety, car safety. And like I said, with our finances, they're, they're happy to put more money to ensure that everyone's safe on set. So I, I don't think people as they're cautious in terms of like that what they're putting their money into but i think where when needed they will put more money in to ensure that we're all safe and fine so i just wanted to add given that you're in this um there is this opportunity to see that there are financiers who are concerned for well-being and putting the money in to ensure that the production is covid safe and this really is an opportunity to think about you know the covid 15 percent as something bigger as something that could be uh, for mental health, for safety in a broader sense, in a kind of permanent sense as well. And I think that would significantly, I, I think that would actually remove some barriers in a sense. It would remove some, some pressures. It would support productions to be much healthier. And that would really be what I'd see as a, a positive from this, from this moment. So I've, I mean, I've, Joy and I had a really lovely um, chat, a couple of a panel discussion a couple of months ago around care and safety. And this notion should actually be developed and, and furthered, particularly if financiers are happy to pay that extra right now. I think it's something that we need to hang on to. Yeah, there's also, oh, sorry. No, no, please. Just that I don't know if this is just me, but I've definitely felt like, especially at the beginning of lockdown, those first few months, that We've, we've always been an industry that even though we are, you know, we're, we're just making films, uh, which is really amazing, but they're films. And there's often a feeling of like life or death with things that are definitely not life or death. And I, I feel like the fact that the whole world has kind of blown up in a different way, it has made maybe some people rethink and like you say, have the time to reflect, you know, what is worth pushing somebody if their mental health is great on you know does that deadline have to be met at that point what's going to happen if it's not met until a month later you know just thinking about actually the the wider context of what we're doing and how we can protect everybody involved um and the things that used to maybe be non-negotiable 
Yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. And and you know what a brilliant idea. Hopefully, once we go beyond this uh, COVID era, and I'm sure we will go beyond it, retaining that 15% extra um, of budget contingency for kind of positive change. I think that makes a lot of sense. And if it does happen, we will take credit for it as having discussed it on this panel. So. Um, just, just, I think we are out of time, unfortunately, but I just want to quickly reiterate to anyone who didn't uh, hear at the beginning, a recording of this event will be available um, on the LFF p &I platform 24 hours after we end now. Um, and you can watch that for anyone who might have missed some of it. So um, yeah, it just leaves me to say thank you very much to everyone for taking the time today. It's been really interesting, I think, and uh, looking forward to hearing much more about all of your future projects. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye. Bye.